Welcome to another edition of the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. He is the legend Dino, and today he's all stripey. He's gone all stripey on me. No, not the uh, West Brom stripey, a wrong direction. He's going from east to west on his stripes. So he's in Rio after all. Good morning, Tim. Yeah, it's kind of Glenn Roda QPR, you know, because uh, he's the another tribute. one who's, who's just left us. And he is the national treasure, dare I say it, the multinational treasure. He is more indestructible than Captain Scarlet. He is the definitive proof that Captain Black is not the bad guy. Can we have <laughs> a big traditional Brazilian shirt name welcome for Dr. Nadebay? I appreciate the Captain. I appreciate the Captain Black reference, and he's already laughed. So we may as well introduce him. You mentioned Glenn Rose. Is it the laugh of, of the Mister Rons? Yeah. That... <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're this on form. The of the Mister <laughs> You are on form today, Legendina. <laughs> you mentioned Glenn Roden. Of course, Glenn Roden has a West Ham connection. And Mr. West Ham, for our benefit today, is the one and only broadcaster and uh, also music critic from time, Mark Webster. Hello, Mark. Hello, fellas. Nice to talk to you. So, I, I'm, uh, Captain Scarlet Star is always great for me. Of course, it, Francis Matthews doing Cary Grant was Captain Scarlet's voice, wasn't it? That's right. That's Famously. right. Famously. Yeah. yeah. And well, well, today we're going back to 1965. Uh, it's just a few days before I enter the world. It's less than a week before before I enter the world. And while we're on 65, I think that might be the year of Thunderbirds. Do you know what? It, 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 if not least... Anything could happen in the next half hour. <laughs> <laughs> do we finish with a quick chorus of Aqua Marina when we leave then, do we? And then we're all, I, I lovely, lovely. It. It, it was Anderson Vision time, wasn't it, in those days? We were just about approaching... The World Cup and everything was on. Everything felt big and ready for action. You know what's great about all of that stuff? It's coming out of slough. It isn't is. that, fan isn't it that is. fantastic? Yeah. All Lady of these th these things that that you know, they're, they're, they're polluting. They're, they're, that my imagination is all formed by Anderson. You know these visions of this glamorous world <laughs> and the the hood in the Malaysian jungle. And it's coming out of slough. Absolutely it's coming out of fantastic. slough. Lady Penelope in her pink stretch Rolls Royce is coming out of slough. Uh, John Betjeman is saying, come friendly bombs and drop on slough, for it is not fit for humans now. There is no place to graze a cow. Swarm over death. Put it on the penalty spot, Tim, and you know I'll bang them in, even though people uh -huh. won't appreciate the singing. Um, so 19th of May 1965 is what we're talking about today. We always look at a, an iconic football match for the Brazilian Shirt Name podcast. We try and analyse an iconic football match. Give us sort of a, a reference uh, to the times that the football match occurred in and also look at the musical soundtrack of that era as well. Uh, as you weren't born at this time, as you weren't born at this time, you may not understand this reference tim but mark will know um oh. because he already had a full beard he was like rumpelstiltskin back in uh, 19th of may of 1965 but you'll remember mark that thunderbirds 2 uh was pregnant with thunderbirds 4 correct uh, and, yeah. and if, if you had the toy model you will know so the equivalent of tim at the moment um, <laughs> that to give birth but more importantly, West Ham are about to um, triumph in their greatest ever match, arguably. I would well, say that's... that's yeah, they're about to become the second English club to win a European title. Yeah. You remember who the first were, Mark? Before, uh, uh, no. Oh, well, that was a hometown question, really. It was Tottenham, two, Tottenham Hotspur two years earlier. Well, the, here's the thing. Obviously, number one, I'm, I'm obliged not to remember anything good that Tottenham have done. It's, it's, I'm genetically coded for that as a West Ham man. But I think more importantly, you have to remember that the, the year 1961 is the important one here because it was the year not only that I was born, but the year that West Ham as a contemporary force was born because that was the year Ron Greenwood joined us as manager. And of course, fundamentally, that's what I guessed him that you'd argue that was 65. The point about 65 is it's that was already the green shoots of of what is going to become the academy in the West Ham way he started to bear fruit. Well, see, I, I find this so fascinating because, you know, that West Ham, 19th of May, 65, they beat 1860 Munich of Germany, 2-0. Quick word on 1860 Who were they? Munich. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> 
quick word on that because that's something that needs to be cleared up. They're a big team. Right. They're a, they're a huge team. Look at the number of supporters that they have taken to London for, for that game. Now, the, the Bundesliga in Germany has only just started just a couple of years earlier. Uh, and it started with a kind of a regulation thing of one team per city. So they're in the first division and Bayern aren't. Franz Beckenbauer has grown up as a, as a fan of 1860 Munich. They're, the, they're wow. the bigger team. Now, what happens over the next few years is 1860 Munich, who are a terrific team, they get it wrong just at the wrong time. They, 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 their decline starts kind of late 60s. And Bayern, who, who win promotion, they get it right just at the right time. And then the definitive moment, Paul Breitner told me this, uh, who was one of the Bayern players, the Munich Olympics of 72. Because ah. uh, um, the uh, remember, this is before TV money. The money comes from the box office. It comes from people buying tickets. And the, 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 uh, the stadium, it was the, the, the Olympic Stadium built, and it's given to Bayern. Because in 72, they've already established themselves as a leading team. Yeah, It's not given to 1860. So Bayern have it. And that means that they can quadruple the crowd. Because they're, they're playing in a small ramshackle stadium. Suddenly, they're playing in this big stadium. Much, much more money. And uh, within two years, they're European Cup champions in, in 74, 75, and 76. But at the time, 1860 Munich are absolutely huge. So West Ham have beaten a big club, a really big club, a club with a big, you know, and the, the number of supporters they've got in, in at Wembley for that game were all the klaxons, you know, all the hunting horns that the Germans used to have at that time. It's huge. And this game, it was seen at the time as perhaps the finest game ever played at Wembley Stadium. And when you think, you know, and, and admittedly, Wembley had only been around for like 42 years mm. and West Ham had played the first game there, hadn't they? The final of the FA Cup final of 23. Whitehorse Cup final, yeah. Indeed. But when you think of like, you know, the, the Hungarians beating England there at Wembley, England beating Brazil in 56, you know, that, that we did a, a podcast about, all those cup finals, the Stanley Matthews Cup final. When you think that this was being seen as a candidate to be the greatest game ever played at Wembley, that tells you the quality of that West Ham side. Wow, yeah. 100,000 people at Wembley. Uh, this was before the all-seater stadiums. 100,000 people. And you can feel that if you watch the, uh, the um, clips from the, uh, the match. It does feel as if there's an energy there that perhaps 1860 we're not used to. I, I was looking at the newspapers of the day. They, they did their training at Kensington Gardens. So in the shadow of Kensington Palace in the centre of London, in the days where an entire football team coming to play a European Cup winners final could actually jog around a park <laughs> in uh, London and not be mobbed. But you said that they got it wrong. And it's a crucial thing here. Arguably, they got the tactics wrong in this match as well, which we'll come to in a moment or two. But I wonder whether... It was as simple as getting the um, the logistics of where the finance in football comes from that they got wrong. Because their stadium, even now, and they've been relegated uh, to the second division, if you like, of the Bundesliga. And they've stayed there for quite some time, <clears throat> which is why you can you know, justifiably ask, who are they? Um, but they... Their stadium is only holds about 18,000 people now. So you think, you know, they're never ever going to get out of that league with that yeah, size Imagine of the if, if they had got the Olympic Stadium. Of course, it would have yeah. been different. Imagine if it was yeah. them. But, different but story. I, but I wonder whether one simple um, twist of fate like that is sufficient to bring about the demise of a football team or whether there's a catalogue of errors that they get yeah, wrong I mean, the, the, along the way. Uh, um, uh, an example I often give on this is uh, the first, you know, the first few years of the Premier League, Tottenham are dreadful. And it's a, you know, it's a moment, it's the wrong time to be bad, isn't it? Because that meant playing catch up against Arsenal for years and years and years. You know, there, there, there are kind of historic moments. If you get it right at that historic moment, a moment of transition and change, you're made. And if you don't, then uh, you're, you're, you're facing you're, you're facing a, a difficult future. Now, West Ham fascinate me. Absolutely fascinate me. I love the whole West Ham thing. Um, although I'm a Tottenham fan, I've got a huge affection for West Ham and, and, and the academy. Uh, and uh, I love talking about this with West Ham, so, uh, with West Ham fans. So I'm, I'm really 
interested in, in Mark's perspective. You talked about Ron Greenwood joining the club in 61. And Ron Greenwood is all about the Hungarian victory. Yes. At Wembley in 53. As are so many, as is Big Mel, Malcolm Allison, who's a vital, who's, 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 in terms of certainly the, the development of Bobby Moore, Big Mel is as important as, as, as Ron in some ways. Well, there were so many players. I mean, Ken Brown's in, uh, yeah. in this, in this lineup and, and there are a lot of coaches. John Bonds around, yeah. yeah. Exactly. There are a lot of coaches went on to be, a lot of play, West Ham players went on to be coaches during this period. It's funny, Puskas turned and he turned all the football, let alone, you know, yeah. the Billy Wright, didn't he? It was an, it was an amazing thing that happened there. And I, from that point of view, Tim, do you, do you suspect, and it goes back to the point Don's making, I guess, on the, on the, on the arguably the boring stuff, the fiscal level of the club, do you reckon there might have been an element of underestimating a what they were going to do as a football club because they just assumed it would work, and B underrating West Ham because they would assume that they would just beat them in the final? No, I don't think so, and I think they play a great game as well. I think it's too. That, that's it, why. Yes. It's, that's why it's held up as as such a great game. I mean, um, the, the West Ham goalkeeper Jim Standen, he has a he has a terrific game. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's two really good sides. Um, well, with West Ham, you've got a culture there. You've got that Italian cafe just opposite the ground. Is it? Yeah. Uh, 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 Cassitaris. Well, that's right. The Cassitaris is there. Yeah. Yeah, when you know the, the players are gathering around and moving the, the the salt pot and the pepper pot and you know and doing tactics like that, mm. and you've got Ron, uh, and uh, Ron, as I say, he's obsessed with the Hungary of 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 fifty three, and you see so much of that in this team. Yeah, and one of the things you don't see it in this game, you see it in England winning the World Cup the following year is the near post, the, the cross to the near post, mm. which uh, you know gets Jeff Hurst lots of goals in the sixty six World Cup. And that's straight off out of Hungary. And Ron, he had all of the players, not just the wingers, practicing the near post cross. Because, you know, it's a fluid game that, 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 that we're going to play. So any of you during the course of the game, you may be in a position to give that, to give that cross. So he, he drilled all of the players in the near post cross. You've also got the idea of the, the flexible front four. Mm. Now, whereas English football had been, you know, Stanley Matthews out on the wing, crossing into to, to Mortensen. You've got a front four, and this is pure Hungary, where they're swapping positions. And the, the, the great star who never was in this team is Johnny Sissons. Johnny Sissons, yeah. Who's just a fantastic player. And Ron Greenwood thought he could be George Best. And for some reason, he never kicked on, a kind of left-footed George Best. But you see Sissons, who's a left winger, cropping up centre forward. Brian Deere, who's right up front, is going out to the left channel. Uh, uh, Sammy De Sil, Alan Seeley, the right winger, he scores mm. both the goals. He's getting yeah. in, in the box to score both the goals. So you've got that flexibility of the front of the front four. Now, that's new in English football. Is that's... there an element of that, Tim, where because arguably it's early and, and we go, and it goes on to be seen as Ramsey's uh, wingless wonders, doesn't it, of course, and, and everything makes sense and the whole plan has come together. But do you, do you think perhaps it's the classic story of any form of pioneer is that Sissons and Seeley, there was a time when Harry Redknapp would have been sort yeah. of on opposite flanks and, and Sissons was endeavouring to make a, a career as a more conventional winger a little bit later on. But as you say, at some point, were they looking at him thinking, I don't know what position you're meant to play. We can't get you into other sides. Well, yeah, maybe. I mean, I know some of the West Ham players would say he was a he was a, a training ground player. He yeah. was one of those players who was fabulous in training, but in the games, you know, and sometimes maybe he, he, his character he just wasn't a big enough personality, right, to to take on the responsibility of of being great. Where they're not very good, West Ham, is when they lose the ball. Yeah, uh, they're just so open. I mean, what they don't do, and I think this is this is one of the reasons that they didn't kick on. What they don't do when they lose a the ball is reduce the space. Mm. They don't know how to do that. Uh, they, they, um, they're, uh, they're all over the place. They're very, very open defensively. Hence the fact that even in this great game that they played, with Jeff Hurst in midfield, mm. which is something that Ron did for the European games, he'd already converted Jeff Hurst to a centre forward. But for the European games, because they were cuter, the, the opposition were, were better at keeping the ball through midfield, he withdrew Jeff Hurst to a midfield role. So he's got an extra man there. And if you're watching this, and thinking, you know, this time next year, that fellow playing midfield for West Ham, he's going to be England centre forward scoring three in a World yeah. Cup final. No, no one's, no one's going to believe no. it. So th that I think is one reason that West Ham didn't quite kick on. That um, that 
that they weren't tight enough defensively. Ron hadn't really organised them in terms of closing down when you lose a ball. That's the difference between Ron and Alf Ramsey, who's playing Ball and Peters as his wingers, and he's getting them back behind the line of the ball, and, and, and England are, are much more compact than West Ham are. But the other one, and here I come to the great bone of contention that I have with West Ham fans, um, is that and Billy Wright writes an article after this game saying West Ham can dominate football for years and years to come. And it, it never happened. No. And I think, and I'm going to probe you for this, Mark, that one of the reasons here is that the relationship between Ron Greenwood and Bobby Moore, which starts really promising, and Moore goes to West Ham to work with... Uh, uh, Greenwood goes to West Ham to work with Moore because they've worked together at England under-23 level, and they've, it's been brilliant. He's a great educator. Moore has question after question after question. So Greenwood wants to go to work, work with Moore, and Moore is saying to the West Ham players, if you want to learn, there's no one better. So it looks so promising. But that relationship very, very soon becomes toxic. Just a few months after this game, that relationship has become toxic. And I reckon it would have been better for all concerned had they let him leave. Uh, you may well say that. Uh, <laughs> I, listen, I, I, I need three players to win the World Cup for England. Mm -hmm. You know, it's important to me. And and Bob, I, I've got, I've talked to the Don about this often before this, this, I've got three great heroes in my life. And it's the, the most contemporary one is Michael Jordan. The middle man is Muhammad Ali. And it starts with Bobby Moore. They're the three icons that I that I cherish most dearly. And I couldn't think of it any other way, except I even I had as a fan, and, and I bet you there's still fans that won't do this, come to terms with the fact that Bobby Moore tried to get out. Now, it's interesting that you reference Ron Greenwood there as being the problem. But if you take it one step back, and of course, famously, the, the story goes that Ron Greenwood says... Um, you're not going anywhere, and if you're not going, and I won't let you play. And if you don't, if you don't play, you can't play for England. As is, is, is how the story goes. Yeah. But in practical terms, what we're talking about there, and this became endemic with his time at West Ham, is how he was treated by the owners of the club. Arguably more important than how he's treated by Ron Greenwood, because if if but, he gets what he there, wants, there's from the, the club, problem. There's the problem because what the manager did in those days was everything. He's organising, he's, all, he's doing the wage negotiations as sure. well. And th there's a huge generational divide between them because, you know, Greenwood is a figure of the maximum wage. You couldn't get rich playing football. No, and then the maximum wage is gone. Johnny Ainge is on £100 a week. Yeah. And more, I, I more fascinates me. He's, an, he's a hero of mine as well. Or, or I, find him a, I find him a very, very complex character, really strange. But more, he wants, he wants the money. Moore is like a prototype, if you like, of Basildon Man, the working class Thatcher. Yeah, story. yeah, yeah. He wants the big house and he wants the cars and he wants the private school for his kids uh, and he wants the mohair suits. I'll oh, forgive him the mohair suits. Uh, um, but, you know, Greenwood can't understand this because in Greenwood's day as a player, that, you know, that just wasn't an option. So Moore will only sign 12 month contracts. Mm. So it means that at the end of every season, they're, they're rowing about £2 a, a, a week, you know. Yeah. You're, you're only paying me 28 and I want 30 and more would hold out for it. And then more goes away, fucking hating him. This is the bastard who's denying me the money. I know that, that he's working, Greenwood is working within a budget set by, by the owners. But the, the, the point of conflict between Moore and the club is Greenwood because it's Greenwood who's doing the negotiations. Right. But apart from the money, I mean, um, West Ham have a terrible season the next season. They're, they're, uh, they're struggling in the, in the league. And then they go out of the Cup Winners' Cup in the semi-finals. Greenwood briefly sacks Moore as captain. He just, he's, he's fed up with him. Mm. Uh, and uh, it's not only the money. I mean, Moore, Moore only plays the World Cup because he signs a 30-day contract with West yes. Ham to get him through the World Cup. He's going he's gonna to go to Tottenham. Yes. And then when... when when England win the World Cup and he's, he's the World Cup captain, the World Cup hero, there's no way that West Ham are going to let him go. So, you know, he's, uh, he's, he's... And in those days, the clubs didn't have to let you go. You know, mm. there's no freedom of contract. You are owned by that club as long as you play football. If they don't want to sell you, they won't sell you. And Moore, who is the great captain for England, for West Ham, he's a terrible, 
terrible captain because he won't be Greenwood's lieutenant. He, he is going to be one of the lads. He's not really one of the lads. They, they, all, they all put him on a, on a, on a separate... On, even Hurst and Peters, who socialised with him, their wives were mates, loved him. And mm. poor old Martin Peters, he, a mate of mine, did a, a, a documentary with him um, on Moore. Not long, you know, just a, a couple of years before, before Martin passed away. And he's already... He's got the, the Alzheimer's and so on. And he couldn't even remember the score of the World Cup final. Mm. The one thing that he could really remember that he really wanted to say about Moro, I loved him. Yeah. But even, even Hurst and Peters, they're not really sure what Moore thinks about them, either as people or as players. Moore is a very private person. You don't really know him, but he wants to be one of the lads. And he's, he's, he becomes, and this, see, this fascinates me about Moro. He's from a, a, a teetotal upbringing. You know, his mum, before his youth games, his mum would wash and iron his bootlaces. <laughs> That's that's the kind of uh, up, he, he he had in he, he, as a kid, he had his shirts hung up in order from from lighter to darker. Wow! You know he's he's really really methodical, teetotal upbringing, but he develops he becomes a heavy drinker. Serious, and uh, yeah, serious and, uh, drinker, yeah. And that's one of the things I think that means that he tails off so quickly after seventy, because he's, he's he's drinking too much. But he, you know because he wants to be one of the lads drinking. And of course, he famously gets Jimmy Greaves in as a companion, doesn't he? When Martin Peters fills in 1970, I think it was. Yeah. He's still in the shadow of, of particularly Hurst and Moore. He goes to Tottenham for this record fee, and Jimmy Greaves goes the other way for is it 40 or 50,000? It's basically a paltry part of the of, of the money. And then Greaves, you've now got Greaves and Moore together, which is sort of relatively fatal. And Greaves couldn't believe the shambles that West Ham was. Yeah. And he thought he was going to the academy. And, you know, the whole thing was just so lax. And part of that is Greenwood is not a ranter and raver. He's, uh, he's and I love Greenwood, he's a great football man. But he was like the reverend, you know, and he sounds a little bit like a braying sheep. And I think the players took the piss, frankly. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and Moore won't step up and be the leader. He won't do it. He won't, he won't help Greenwood out. He's one of the lads having a giggle at the back. And then he's, he's out drinking, always drinking halves. Yes. So you never know. And when he's going home in his big car, he puts on a chauffeur's cap so he doesn't get stopped. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's you know, unbelievable stories uh, um, about him. Such a, such a fascinating character. But not working, not functioning as a West Ham captain. When he was the great England captain, uh, I'm convinced that West Ham would have done better just to say, look, it ain't working. And look, when Greenwood got the England job, who did he bring in as assistant? There you go. Yeah. Jeff Hurst. Jeff didn't Hurst. Want any, didn't want anything to do with Moore. And for some reason, Moore is unbelievably mistreated by football. Unbelievably mistreated by football. After He couldn't get a job. No. You know, he, he, did, he did South End a little bit. And that's it. And you're thinking, as an assistant coach, this man should be with the England team. You know, he's everything. But for some reason, word has got round, I think, the football community about that toxic relationship with, with, with Greenwood and Moore, and he gets frozen out, which is an enormous shame, an enormous loss to English football. This is so fascinating, you know, because this is proper football history that we're uh, hearing here. And I genuinely am humbled by the amount of knowledge that you guys have about this. Clearly, from what you're saying... We're both fascinated with, with him. Yeah, but clearly from what you're saying, this match, this crucial match at Wembley, uh, the Cup Winners' Cup final at Wembley between West Ham and 1860 München is a preamble to the World Cup a year later, less than a year later, less than 12 months later, or sorry, just over 12 months later. It's a preamble you know never, to that. You know what never gets mentioned in the commentary? Never, not even once. The war. It's, 20, it's only 20 years after well, this. Well, yeah. funny these enough. These are the Germans coming back. Probably, pa pr perhaps pointedly so. Yes, yes, I think so. Funny you should yeah. say that, because on the front page of The Guardian, on the 19th of May, this important day in the footballing calendar, front page of The Guardian is the Queen going to Germany, um, and it's the first sort of sense of Germany and Great Britain coming together putting bygones behind them and to sort of 
come again peacefully after the war. This is the first attempt at bringing Germany back into the European fold of democratic nations, amongst other things. So there is that sense in the greater mm. landscape, not in football, not in football, and perhaps that's appropriate as well, that football isn't talking about the war. Don't mention the war. This is a football match between, often enough, working class people um, against other working class people who are the innocents when it comes to wars. They're not the ones that make the decisions to go to the war. This is what it says in The Guardian on the 19th of May. So this is the day of the match. So this is a preamble to the match. Uh, an article by Albert Barham of The Guardian it says three reasons why West Ham should succeed. West Ham United should defeat TSV Munich 1860 in the final of the European Cup Winners' Cup this evening at Wembley Stadium and at the same time preserve a place in the competition next season a not inconsiderable bonus for the winners. By the way, the, the, the players were earning 30 quid a week at this point and they got an £800 bonus uh, for wow. beating, yeah, for winning uh, the match. Anyway, three factors influence this forecast of success for West Ham. First, they are a team who play methodically with a tactical efficiency instilled by Mr. Ron Greenwood, one of the most forward thinking wow. managers in Britain. Secondly, Wembley will be almost a home match. For here, they qualified for this competition by winning the FA Cup final a year ago. That's important in this concert. Um, Thirdly, they benefit by having no travel worries and no change of food and environment. <laughs> well, you laugh, Mark, but those, I imagine, in those days were very oh, crucial really. elements. Well, I, I mean, you only have to go back a few years to know how crucial it was when poor old Tottenham arrived in London's Docklands to have a lasagna prior to an all-important <laughs> game against West Ham. <laughs> <laughs> and managed to see off half of their first 11 and lose the match. And indeed, European status is a direct result. So let us not mock the importance of international cuisine in this matter. You're right. You're absolutely well, right while, to bring that up. While we're talking about international travel, and this is how seriously Ron Greenwood took this thing, they West Ham, the players, they'd seen Munich twice during that season. They'd seen them early... Because, uh, you know, uh, West Ham, Ron had seen that 1860 Munich were in the Cup Winners' Cup. And there was a chance to see them right at the start of the season. So they did that. And then to reach the final, 1860 Munich had a playoff in, in Switzerland. And Ron took the whole team. Wow. It, it Which would be rare, wouldn't it? I should imagine. Yeah, unbelievably rare. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. Just, it, it shows how, how cosmopolitan Ron is. Yeah. Now, this is the year that pizza is sold for the first, the first pizza <laughs> restaurant opens in London. You That's know what I mean? That's important. We're, that is important, We're opening mate. up to the world. It that is, because is... that means jazz gets played as well, doesn't it? Which is the important thing in Pizza Express. You know, I, 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 I remember, I remember in 1977, Pizza Hut, rather than Pizza Express, had a promotion, eat as much pizza as you like for 50p. That was in 1977. I used to see the banner everywhere I went in London. I'd never eaten a pizza in 1977 when I was 17. Yeah. By the way, Mark, I'm shocked that you were born in 1961 because I always feel like you're at least 100 years older than I am. I happen to be the oldest person on this podcast, only by a few months or you know a couple of years. It's the little mind. victories, though, Doc. I know. <laughs> clearly, for, we for West Ham fans, it's been so a long I'll, time. I'll take since... what I can get. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time since one of those little victories really <laughs> Mattered. And this point in 19th of May 1965 was one of those important times. So let's not mock this. Look, th this article in The Guardian is interesting, though. If I might just uh, add a little bit more to this. This is an article by Albert Barham, who says, Munich are a good side, hard, fast and fit in typically German manner. So even then there was this stereotype. <laughs> the stereotype was working, yeah. Exactly. Tony Allemann, a Swiss international wing forward, now with Nuremberg, told me in Germany last week, on their day, they are the best team in Germany with backs that cling to the wing forwards tenaciously and tackle ruthlessly. I think we saw that once or twice in this match, Tim. Yeah, although, you know, West Ham mess them around. 
with the fluidity of their front four. Yeah. You know, by having the, the you know, the, the wingers are, are in the penalty box at times and, 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 and Brian Stag Deer is, is moving out to the, uh, so I, th- I think West Ham win the tactical battle, mm. but they can play, you know, uh, although there are times, you know, cause one thing that Munich did better than West Ham is reduce space when they lost the ball. And there are times when Munich play with a very high line and they're saying to West Ham, we're going to play the game in your half for a while. And if the ball's played behind our line, our goalkeeper, who's an absolute star, is going to come out and, and clear it. So it, it, it's an intriguing battle. There's, there's ebb and flow. And there are times when you think Munich are getting on top. It's, it's, it's a great game to watch. It's one of those games from the past where you are well advised not just to watch the highlights, but watch the whole oh. game unfold. Can I ask you to, do you think of, of, on Bobby Moore again as well, that the fact that what, obviously he, be, he kind of becomes renowned for, for basically, you know, uh, the timing of his tackling seems to, is obviously clearly crucial. And, and there's the t- tackle against Pele, which exemplifies the whole thing. But for me, even obviously as, as a kid, when I'm seeing him late in the day and then seeing old footage, to watch a centre half, which is what he would have had to have been called, carrying the ball out from the back, yeah. And basically making offensive passes, yeah. you know, attacking passes rather than giving it to the guy who's going to give it to the guy. Was that something that he would have got from Ron Greenwood, or was that were there other players already sort of were pioneering that style? He got it from Big Mal. Ah, Big Mal, okay. Big Mal worked with him again and again and again on this, and Big Mal gave him what he said was the most important lesson of his career. You haven't got the ball. If I get it now, who am I going to give it to? So, you know, he's, he's, he's looking around. All right, if I get the ball now, it goes there. Uh, and and he, Big Mal developed him. Um, lots of individual training sessions. And he played a game for the reserves when he'd he done a fantastic marking job, I think on Barry Bridges of Chelsea. And back in a training room, in a, in a dressing room, Big Mal says, if you ever play like that again, I, I don't want to know you. Because all you, all you did was mark. You didn't construct. And you are fantastic constructing. And the thing that makes more, and I, I watched more not long ago um, playing for England in the 62 World Cup when he just got into the side. Yeah. And there he's, he's, he's an old fashioned wing half. He's, so he's playing a little bit further forward in midfield. What makes him, and again, Ron is, is instrumental in this, back four. Yeah. Put him alongside a stopper centre back, you know, Kenny Brown here for West Ham, Jack Charlton a year later for England. Yeah. So the stopper centre back is there to mark. He's there to he, he's there to be free to see the danger. Uh, and uh, on Jock Steen, the Scotland manager, he, he said, you know, that there, there should be a law against Bobby Moore. He sees what's <laughs> going to happen five minutes before any, any anyone else. So he was fabulous at reading the game and winning the ball. But the unbelievable thing about his game is setting attacks in motion. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, for me, it's one of the greatest examples. The last minute of the '66 World Cup final, England are three-two up. The ball is in the England penalty area. Germany are pressing like mad. Moore has the ball. Jack Charlton is yelling at him. You know, put it in rows red. Put it in rows. Yeah, just get red, son. Get red. And what does Moore do? Wanders around a bit, sees the pass, up to Jeff Hurst. They think it's all over. It it is now. Do you know what he's doing, of course? He spent his entire career making sure he didn't get those laces that his mum had cleaned and ironed dirty (laughs) by using the inside of his boot only whenever he passed the football. That was exactly what that was. But, you know, the important thing... I find him so fascinating because, you know, in teetotal environment, with yeah. a very, very dominant mother who could never believe, no, my, my, my Robert wouldn't have done that. No, my Robert didn't do that. <laughs> and he turns into someone who has a drinking problem. This well, is, it, it's, it's bizarre, this. He owned that pub, didn't he? He, he bought a pub. Um, it was called Bubbles, I think it was. Um, well, he, he lost a lot of money with his business deal, well, of course. He, he, he had Epi, Epi for his country club. That's with right. Sean country Connery club for top, for top people. Lost well, him a fortune. That pub's yeah. on the corner of, is it Roman Road and uh, Hackney Road, isn't it? It's still there. It's still a pub. It's not called Bubbles anymore. I think afterwards, a couple of the actors from EastEnders bought it after Bobby Moore. But at the time that Bobby Moore owned it, I, I used to take the bus past that 253 bus and it was like in claret and blue and it was called bubbles yeah so he also had for a while and this worked for him he had a sports shop opposite opposite west ham yeah that's and right that worked for him 
And he made more money from that for a while than he did for playing for West Ham, which shows you how footballers were underpaid at the There's, time. Uh, and there is, this is, and the, perhaps this explains everything. And this is, goes back to his, you know, his, his that early life and, uh, and when he was married to Tina Moore. They were living in Chigwell in Essex, which is about as it's about as Sam Moritz of Essex as, as anything can possibly be. It was, and um, um, I had. My mum had two sisters, Aunt Eva and I, Eileen. And Aunt Eileen, she married well. She was a receptionist at a doctor's and she ended up marrying the doctor. And they lived in Chigwell. And we used to go visiting them. And I'd never seen anything like it. My dad was driving down there and it had trees down the middle of the road. I'd never seen the like, yeah. I tell yeah. you. And then and we used to have dinner off of glass plates. And she did mash and roast potatoes for Sunday dinner. It was, it was incredible. It was another world. But, but she used to regale the stories of the fact that um, she used to see Tina Moore in the laundrette in Chigwell. Which and, and I can only assume that means that, that going to the laundrette was a relatively glamorous thing to do at the time. It's, it meant that a machine was doing the work for you rather than you having to do it yourself. You know, it's a really fascinating story because I think that what you've just alluded to there, uh, Mark, is that the the Cockney aspiration. It's aspirational. This is, yeah, this is a proper yeah. Cockney story, and there are so many similarities between the Cockney story and the immigrant story coming into the United Kingdom. You know, for the Cockneys. Yeah still today, to a certain extent, going east into Essex, Chigwell and Environs was the aspiration, you know. Absolutely right. Be first, my son, do well in life and move to Chigwell. So <laughs> I can totally, I, well, no, this is important. The glamorous life. Remember, we're talking about West Ham where probably most of the players would have been Cockney, born within the sounds of Bow Bells in those days. All, and almost forget- all of them. I mean, Jeff Hurst is, is a little bit of an outsider because he comes from Chelmsford. Yeah, it it's was a little bit Celtic. That's it, it, it was still that. In Essex, and, and, and Essex. Well, of course, this is the thing that you have to kind of remind people is that they're they're from the East London rather than the East End because the Bow Bells is a is a city thing, and and You're absolutely right. And until the early sixties. West Ham was actually still part of Essex because it was, you know, the yeah. GLC came along and, and it, it sort of became part of Greater London. So I always, funny enough, I always say to people, I'm a proper Londoner, I'm from Essex. You know, it's, uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's kind of how I, it's how I try and make my, claim my place in the world. This, uh, is, this is why the history is so vital. Remember, when you were a Cockney because you were born within the sounds of Bow Bells. In those days, you didn't have the motor traffic blotting out the sounds of Bow Bells. That's true. So it's the sound of Bow Bells, exactly. <laughs> sound of Bow Bells resonated way beyond what it would resonate now. I think, There's people in Dover who are claiming that, aren't there? <laughs> I think if you hear the sound of Bow Bells within a couple of blocks of Bow Bells now, you're doing really well. Yeah. But, you know, this is a proper sort of, London story. The West Ham go to mm. Wembley, the greatest stadium in the world at the time, arguably, and it was in London, part of London. 100,000 fans there. It's a home match, as we've already alluded to. All of those 100,000 tickets for the match were sold even before um, England's match with Hungary that comes about a month before this, a few weeks before this, with as many as 10,000 Munich supporters travelling. Wow. Officials were then hoping that as many people as possible would arrive early and 100 turnstiles would be operating from 5.30 in the evening. Otherwise, there would be chaos on the roads to Wembley as the crowd mixes with the home-going travellers, as it were. So a huge match for West Ham. The crowd of 100,000 uh, would pay something like £75,000 altogether. So you're talking about 75p per ticket on average, which is you know unheard of these days, which would surely you delight... Lot, you lot did it in shillings, didn't you, in your time? Well, it's yeah, really... in our times. Pounds, shillings and pence, I, mate. I'm not prepared we... to do the sums, though, <laughs> to work out quite that. That's well, always beyond well, me. Well, you say that, Mark. Ten shillings. That was... The, that was uh, ten shillings was 120 pennies, yeah? That was the thing about our generation. We knew how to do our maths, unlike, you know, Tim's generation of uh, 100 pennies to how many? How many bob is that? Is that right. Bob? <laughs> so, right. Well, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you one thing. If, if, if this helps you, Tim, to kind of understand the whole Bobby Moore, Ron Greenwood situation, as far as Bobby Moore's concerned, all he was ever offered was a two-bob contract. 
<laughs> that, would, that would have been that's that's how that would have been explained. And half a crown was a dollar in those days, okay? Four dollars <laughs> to the pound. Just think about that. You should get your sums right. What about the charts? And look, it was a great game. Bobby Moore that we've talked about a lot. I don't think people should forget he was an incredibly young man at this point. You may have been the greatest captain that Britain or that England ever had certainly became that for winning the World Cup a year later. Um, he was a defensive midfielder, but arguably a defensive or a, a centre-back at this point. But he makes the second goal from a free kick. And it is such an immaculately taken... The one thing... Training ground. Training ground, training ground, oh, training ground. Totally. Worked, worked, worked. So that totally. Draw onto the near post, you over, you, you, you've got an overload at the far. And also, it's the elegance that comes from a training ground, repeatedly training ground practice. It looks as if you weren't even sweating over this one. Mm. You know, you knew exactly what you were going to do. Bobby Moore always played with a certain elegance, you know, mm. uh, straight back and, like you say, forward thinking, thinking about I, two I or loved, three moves I loved ahead. seeing him. It's in my earliest memories of football. Like oh, of more, course. Or, He's like a chess grandmaster. Well, just He's the like, way that he walks out. With the ball, yeah. you know, on his hip. Yeah, on his yeah. hip, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Do you, remember, do you remember that famous move? You will remember when I just point my hands forward. Do you remember that? But it was, was it against Brazil? But basically, he does this move where he points his hand forwards, like saying to the opposition, am I going to go left or am I going to go yeah. right? Do you remember <laughs> that famous one? It was a very simple move to make, but it's a good question mark. You put doubt in the minds of the opponent as to, look, I've got options here. You call, you make the call. And that's like a chess grandmaster. If I do this, what are you going to do? If I do that, what are you going to do? Mm -hmm. And Bobby Moore always seemed to me to be very much like Franz Beckenbauer. And it's interesting mm -hmm. that both of these captains met at that um, famous match at Wembley in 1966. Very much like Frank, uh, Franz Beckenbauer, that you thought that he was thinking two or three moves ahead of time. But he makes that goal, and the second goal is probably the goal of the match, of the two goals of the match, the second mm. goal from a free kick. So, somewhat innocuous free kick, you would have thought, but it ends up going in the back of the neck, thanks to uh, Seeley, who gets both goals. Died at a very young age, sadly. But, and and um, can I just say, funnily enough, his nephew, um, it's, a, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's, it's kind of a lovely little story because it, Les Seeley, his nephew, ended up at West Ham right at the back end of his career, goalkeeper on the bench and famously, and I, I say famously because he enjoyed it so much, he was put on as a substitute up front. Now, and, and goalkeepers have scored goals. We all know that. Deadly around the six-yard box when they're taking free kicks in their own six-yard box that bounces <laughs> over the other goalkeeper. But to actually, to actually get a, a goalie to go and play out, to come on as a sub, to play outfield, and he had the time of his life, and he was a, apparently a wonderful fella. The, the Sydney family, Tim, I mean, you mentioned, obviously, his uncle there. Apparently, they were just great people, and, uh, and Les was a, an exemplary member of that family. Yeah, so there was a soundtrack to this 19, 19th of May, 1965, a Wednesday evening in London town and elsewhere around the world. Wednesday evening, there was a soundtrack to go with this uh, incredible match. Uh, number one, perhaps quite appropriately, was King of the Road, Roger ah. Miller. So many people have covered this, Mark, and not least the Proclaimers did a half-decent version of it, but... When you go back to the original, as you do with so many of these songs, it was done so perfectly that every cover version of the song, and it is a great song to cover, uh, harking back a little bit to the 1950s sort of uh, uh, Frank Folky. Sinatra. No, I see it as more folk, more kind of finger see, in the ear I see it, tradition. I see it as more Frank Sinatra from that incredible albums you know songs for swinging love he's done some riddle called. albums yeah i i know what you, he's roger has got a very smooth voice it's a hobo song though isn't it which would lend itself nicely to tim's notion of it being more folky but he's but his delivery is is very cool almost yeah, if you're going to go rat pack perhaps dean martin style 
there's something a little bit middle of the road about it. By the way, room's around 50 cents, so three shillings, Tim. I, I don't know if that's... <laughs> I, I may have made that up. Funny you should say that. The cheapest hotel room I ever managed to get in my hitchhiking days was about 1982 or thereabouts it would have been. Hitchhiking, I got to Seville in uh, Spain and there were two options either to go out and find some hippies out in the caves outside town to keep on their floor in a cave or somebody said look I know this hotel where you can stay for 50p a night and I was like 50p are you having a laugh yeah you could stay for 50p a night but essentially where you were staying was you were sleeping on a camp bed in the hallway of the hotel you know lots of youngsters do that yeah you shrug your shoulders Mark the only thing was it was a little bit too intimate. <laughs> yeah. Was that a, a cheap by jail, were you? Well, I don't I don't want to bring down the tone of this conversation, but you know, some people had midnight habits that kept you awake all night. Let me just Tim, leave it at that. Tim, have you noticed he's, he's very big on the 50p spend? That's his uh, all you can eat pizza up. Right? And yeah. now he's that's right. <laughs> that's right. On well, a camp bed in a corridor. I'm glad you mentioned the all you can eat pizza hut because the cheapest place to eat in Europe at the time, and I read this in Time Out, so I had to go and check out the place, it was a place called Che, uh, was it no, Casa Miguel? And that was in Paris, where you could eat for five francs, which would have been the equivalent of 50p, 50p at the time. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. There were 10 francs to a pound, essentially. For five francs, you could eat a three course meal. I went to Casa Miguel, little kind of like, you know, rundown restaurant in the middle of town. And there, the first course would have been like, you know, like what you got at school dinners, cheese and biscuits. And the second course would have been, you know, some kind of like watery rice with a little bit of chicken that had died a long, 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 long <laughs> time ago. And uh, the third course was like an apple. Oh, yeah, you've got three courses and a glass of wine. Let me just say that should have been a glass of plonk, plonk but it was 50p. Five francs for that, yeah. So I, I'm, I'm hooked up on that. But look at the chart. So Roger Miller, King of the Roads, number one. Ticket to Ride by the Beatles is number Number two, that ain't a bad number two, and it it's coming down, down from number one. It's it? coming yeah. down from number one, indeed. Um, it's, well, where would you put that mark in the sort of uh, annals of Beatles history? Because I think that song is somewhat overlooked. Hearing it again now, I think what a brilliant song, and they clearly enjoyed writing it together, McCartney and Lennon. This one, uh, but also the Beatles just got the best out of this song. It would. It, I, I'm going to guess by way of their sound, they they weren't still far off of being the please please me Beatles, were they? I mean, we're only right. a, we're only two or three years into their tenure, and I, I, I just do, most of us would assume that Sergeant Pepper's is where the big crossover, the big change is going to happen, but that's still a few years away. But I guess the point you make is valid in the sense where. It, it it sounded much more mature than what we'd already heard, and we and and but that was only from a couple of years prior. So I guess their chops were improving dramatically and very quickly. Well, this is the the, the, the thing for me about the sixties: the pace of change is just mm. unbelievable, and you can't imagine this on Hard Day's Night a year earlier. It's only a year earlier. Yeah, uh, and it's it's an extraordinary record. It's it's almost proto heavy rock in a way. You know, I mean, it's uh, they haven't got the technology for heavy rock, but it's no. you know those massive chiming guitars and 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 uh, uh, Ringo is pounding the fuck out of the drums. You know, he's doing well. Yeah, he's doing well. And you know, it's 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 just a it's a really big sound. Uh, and well, I think they discovered cannabis. Frankly, I think that may ah. have something to do with it. <laughs> well, you say that. I think they discovered poetry, you know, and I think they got the essence of their poetry right on this. It's a really profound song. I've always thought of it as kind of like just one of those happy-go-lucky Beatles songs, like Yellow Submarine. No. Like, She's got a ticket to ride, but she don't care. It's kind of almost like a football anthem. Is how I've always heard it. Yeah, but, but he's, he's, he's too stoned to react. Isn't he? Yeah. He's, he's, he's just going to let you know. He's, he's just going to let her go. But yeah. see, th this for me is, is the key thing about the Beatles. They're they're not comparing themselves with Tommy Steele. They're not even comparing no. themselves with Elvis Presley. They're not comparing themselves with Motown, much though though they love it. They're comparing themselves with with Magritte. 
You know, this is the generation of working class kids who have never been educated to this level ever before. So their cultural points of references, you know, from art school and so on, are just, you know, and that, that's one of the things that's driving them on. That they, the, the key word from their career is develop. You know, we want to develop. We want to get better. Uh, and uh, that's one of the things that is leading this extraordinary pace of change. I think they're underestimated. I totally, honestly do. I totally agree. And, and this is where you hear that they're the poets of their generation. See, I hadn't thought of this before, Tim, until you said it. And this is how you riff on a live and direct podcast. You know what live and direct means, don't you, Tim? It means live and direct. <laughs> Exactly, because no. we had a few special requests to the to the to the to the Notting Hill posse. So, yeah. so it means exactly the same thing, but in a Jamaican accent. Is that exactly. Like that? Well, yeah. that's the way Aswad did it when they were meanwhile gardens for the carnival live and direct album. But now the that you mentioned posse. that, that's the one. Labrador yeah. Grove, indeed, meanwhile gardens. But now that you mentioned that, I'm thinking actually, what they're discovering is like the poetry of W. H. Auden where they think, where they say, I mean, the lyrics are just amazing. Remember, the poets of your generation capture an emotion or an entire drama in just a couple of lines. They say, I think I'm going to be sad. And I think it's today. Mm. Yeah, the girl that's driving me mad is going away. And, and then the next verse, amazing. She said that she's living, or she says that living with me is bringing her down for she would never be free when I was around. So she's got a ticket to ride. That's so profound and so deep that when you, when you hear it, the way they sing it, it's almost kind of like just part of the, you know, the, the joviality of the song, if you like. But actually it's one of those juxtaposed lyrics that is much, much deeper than the sound of the song, I think. No, I like what, and just to pick up on the point you made, Tim, is I think that where that fits perfectly is that he isn't sure, is he? Because he, he's, he's living in such a fug, he's not even yeah. convinced he knows I think, he's yeah. sure that she's going. So the, I think it's, it's such it, a beautiful, because it changes the entire point and and, and polarity of the song, doesn't it? From what would be an ordinary pop song. But isn't it disrespectful, Mark, to suggest, as Tim does, maybe correctly, but nevertheless, that, oh, this is part of the drug haze that they're under? Because I think, OK, the drugs can enhance uh, your sense of uh, art, if you like. They can enhance it or they can, you know, um, distract from it. But I think that the... The, the the talent is already there. The oh, clear, um, clearly, clearly. Yeah, yeah. I think I think what it, I think perhaps it's the bit in the middle. And again, but it's perhaps what you were alluding to anyway, Tim. Is that is is that what it's given them the capacity to do is create a character to tell the story in that song. It's not necessarily them speaking speak directly from the heart and their soul. It arguably is them speaking from a state of mind that they can see is useful to turn into something which will work really nicely in the song where this guy is so not with it that he's not even, he, he hasn't even noticed that the most important thing of his life is about to walk out the door. Well, the key words for that kind of mid to late 60s is perception. It's the word that's on everyone's minds. And, and yeah, you know, you're, you're taking a substance to give you a different perception. Mm. And then taking it from there, I agree. But no, I think they're absolute geniuses. I mean, th there's two couplets that for me sum up, they're from a couple of years later, but they sum up the generation generational divide in a way that, that your, your WH Ordens and so on would, would, would find hard. And one is the Beatles, she's leaving home. She's leaving home after living alone for so, for, for, for so many years. That, that's the generation gap in, in, you know, in two lines. Yeah. And, and uh, there's, an, there's another turn on it a more humorous turn by a group of lads who may well be, have been West Ham fans, the, the small faces. Um, here we all are sitting on a rainbow. Hello, Mrs. Jones. How's your Burt's Lumbago? <laughs> you no, know, again, you get a generation gap there. Yeah. In fucking, in just two lines. It's incredible. It's, got, it's, got, it's gone from absolutely brand spanking new back to the music call in one simple yes. move, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. So, we have to know, give the, a bit... The creativity that's going on there is just unbelievable and I'm, I'm fascinated with all of this era um but let's pay respect to the building block because the building block is black american music you know it, it is. is everyone everyone every one of these uh, the, the, the big bands 
with the possible exception of the Hollies, who've perhaps more got of a of a pop sensibility, they're all R and B bands in that in that late fifties, early sixties sense of R and B, because there is nothing else. Yeah. Uh, and and something of great cultural significance, huge cultural significance, has just happened. It's recorded in, eight, in, in at the end of March, and it goes out at the end of April. Ready, steady, go with the Motown special. The Motown right. artists have just come over and they've been on Ready, Steady, Go. And Ready, Steady, Go is a thing that's taking this and spreading it to the world. Uh, and, the, you know, the English kids, the English working class kids, just got it and saw it and lapped it all up. And 65, this is the big year for the breakthrough of Motown in England. It also means that it's going to put, it's going to make obsolete the cover versions now, in, in the charts this time, you've got you know, the animals doing Bring It On Home To Me, which is oh, a nice version. And, but, uh, but as a tribute, it's not Sam Cooke. You cannot it, do It was Sam a tribute, Cook. though, wasn't it? I think because he'd only died a few months prior. And yeah. I'm guessing, I mean, I don't know, but I'm assuming that was the deliberate act on their part was to But, but what, makes me feel what makes me feel uncomfortable about that cover is that here's the animals, bigger in the States than... <clears throat> They are in the UK. They're absolutely massive in the States, and quite rightly so, because they did this iconic version of uh, a New Orleans blues classic, House of the Rising Sun, and, and they turned the blues into a popular music, if you like, and I, I got that. But here, they're selling coals to Newcastle, <clears throat> And Newcastle lapping it up like they've never seen the black. Well, stuff literally before. Newcastle, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. No, but, <laughs> but America. See, but this, in this, this isn't going to happen anymore. You know, uh, Manfred no, after Manfred's this, in, you're right. Yeah, Manfred Mann's in the charts with mm. uh, Oh No, Not My Baby, the Maxine Brown yeah. thing. Mm -hmm. And and up until that point, there are so many of these. You know, the bands. What's coming out in the states? All right, let, let's do that. And let's get a cover version out. That yeah. stops. Sil now. Silla Black was basically just. One step always behind Dion Warwick, it would seem, yeah, wouldn't it? Yeah, and, yeah. And, you know, it's a literal example of, and of course, the Beatles got their career going covering the Icy Brothers. Indeed. So, and and, that, that's and just about to stop because now yeah. people are seeing the authentic, you know, Motown. Yeah. And, and so that those cover versions, in fact, I think the greatest English band to do it just get to the scene a little bit too late. They were releasing their first record just a few months after that. That's a, a, a band called The Action, who did, uh, they did a version of, uh, and they're produced by George Martin, who's gone and see them at the Bedford Hotel, you know, in, 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 uh, in Ballam. You know? And he's fucking, we'll have some, and it's, it's <laughs> great. Uh, and the, the, the singer there, Reggie King, just fan, you know, he does a version of Since I Lost My Baby, The Temptations. They do it, they arrange it brilliantly for guitars. And he's going head to head with, uh, with uh, David Ruffin. And he's as good, you know, he's unbelievable. Wow. They do a version of um, I'll Keep On Holding On, which is a Marvelettes record. And it's honestly better than the original. And they got George Martin, they got Parlophone, but it's just too late. The cover versions have gone now. We don't want to do that. What we want to do is we want to get a hand, we, we want to get a hand on the originals. So I, I think that that uh, uh, goes out at the end of April 65, uh, the, the Motown review on Ready, Steady, Go. I think that's one of the key moments in British music history. And I think you're quite right to bring it up as a key moment in uh, British musical history. But I think when you look at the charts of the 19th of May, 1965, this day when uh, West Ham have their greatest, arguably their greatest uh, footballing success ever, winning the Cup Winners' Cup at Wembley against 1860 Munich. What, what I look at this is still an era that is still anchored very much in the 1950s. I mean, it pisses me off, to be frank to hear the cover version of True Love Ways, one of the great Buddy Holly songs by Peter and Gordon. They oh, it's like, oh, dear. It, it pisses yeah, me off, rubbish. Mark. I mean, I, can't, I have to hold myself back and think I'm not going to throw something at, at my uh, record player hearing that. <clears throat> True Love Ways, when you hear it by Buddy Holly, he ekes out every sinew of emotion and uh, teenage angst out of it romantic angst out of it what they've done is just to literally we are covering buddy holly here you know there's, there's no sort of sentimentality about it it's just they, they've turned like, a genius song as well into something as as so appallingly trite you, you you'd thought it's almost impossible to, ru to ruin it that much and yet that's they pop succeed. music isn't it that's pop yeah. music let's just find a way through subterranean homesick blues comes in there there's still a lot yeah, of so blues we've we, we got to talk about dylan because yeah. dylan is on oh, tour yeah 
and this is hugely important. Dylan on tour in England. Uh, I'm personally, I'm not a great, a great fan of that kind of sneering thing. I've never really got into it. But the influence is enormous. I mean, the influence on the Beatles. Now, he mm. forces the Beatles to up their game lyrically. But also, I only found out this, this out the other day. And the following year, the Four Tops, Reach Out, I'll Be There. What they, you know, Holland Dozier Holland, who are producing it, what they say to Levi Stubbs, a singer, we want you to sing it like a kind of black version of Dylan. Mm. Like a kind of staccato, you know... Uh, and I listened to it, and I thought, yeah, it's right. So all these things, are, uh, it's such a creative moment, and all these things are cross-fertilising each other. I've got to say, because Dotton and I obviously get to talk about Bob Dylan a lot, and in all these various de- guises on Five Live, and, and he's not my cup of tea either, And but Dotton will always find the poet within him, which, of course, is, is a genuine thing. But we often have, we'll, we'll play a Bob Dylan tune, and there was one we played recently, I forget what it was, apologies, in which he's got a completely new voice, one I'd not heard before, and I didn't, I thought, do you know what? I quite like that. He's, is he's he not cl- sneering No, him. exactly, he's not doing that thing. But the weird thing is, I like that, machine gun attack of subterranean homesick yeah, blues. Yeah, no, it's great. It's, it's a weird one. If Bob Dylan never existed before that record or after it, if it was if that was some kind of weird one-hit wonder, that would have been a brilliant and important record. Because as you say, it's giving Motown acts who are going to go into the 60s and later into the 70s and, and working with Norman Whitfield and having to find a new way of kind of yeah. broaching it, not that arguably, the, you know, the sweet way that early Motown did. It's given them a new sort of like an anger to an aggression that they can attack songs with. There is a oh. symmetry in the charts with regards to Bob Dylan. He's at number 10 with Subterranean Homesick Blues, but he's at number 20 double the price, as it were, uh, or t- t- double your money and take it away, as Huey Green would have said once <laughs> upon a time. <laughs> exactly. Um, with the times they are a-changing, which is Ugh. complete juxtaposition from subterranean homesick blues. Well, and it's, it's a Dylan that, that he's already moved on, isn't he? You know, he, yes, he starts yes. as, a, as a kind of folk protest singer. And he, I think he just hates being in a, in a straitjacket of being a folk protest singer. Well, so you know, 65, he, he goes off into surrealism. Was sixty five the elect the, 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 the when did yeah, he come he here and the whole electric thing and booed Judas. out of, booed out of Newcastle <laughs> yes, whatever yeah. it was. I say the exact yeah, it was right. Manchester, ah, wasn't yeah. it? It, it right, was a was Manchester it. trades <laughs> trade hall. Uh, but and I did an obituary of the guy that shouted out Judas. Actually, You're died you know, going back about really? fifteen years ago. Yeah, I did an obituary about him. Um, I and don't it believe was... you. <laughs> but, you know that sneering that you talk about, Tim. Remember, every artist, and and Mark, I'm sure you will accept this, every artist has their voice, their unique voice. The mistake of artists is to try and um, sing in a way that's out of their natural, um, not comfort zone, but natural um, inclination. Their voice anchors the way they sing. It wasn't until my wife pointed out to me that Peter Tosh, who is my great mentor in life, sounds like Nina Simone. He's got one of those voices that lends itself to protest. When you hear Nina Simone doing a love song, it's almost like it's got to be slightly dispassionate because that's not where her voice is at. No, she's not sweet, is she? I once saw a a documentary saying that the, the bodyguards that she had were not to protect Nina Simone. They were to protect the audience from Nina, from Nina Simone. Simone. Oh, <laughs> that is very true. But my good friend, uh, who, who you will know, Mark, um, David Corio, photographer, yeah. he, he loved Nina Simone so much. He had literally like 80 albums by Nina Simone. Literally 80 albums by Nina Simone. He, She was his greatest musical inspiration. And one day, because he's a photographer, press photographer, goes and does this amazing photograph of her that he wants to present to her. So he goes backstage as us journalists were wont to do back in the days when we got sort of access all areas passes. He went backstage with this huge photograph that he had blown up to present to her. So he's walking up to her and she turns around and sees her and says, ah, what is that? Get it away from me, get it away from me, get it away from me. And he has to turn tail. Well, that's a true story. 
Um, wow. He and, thought he was doing the best thing that Nina Simone had ever ha- d- done to Nina Simone. He was lucky that she didn't have a bread knife available oh. to her. Charlie Records will tell you what she did with the bread knife uh, to them, you know, when they put out My, baby, my just baby Just Cares For Me. And yeah. got it back to number one. But nevertheless, yeah. she had a bread knife available at that time. Well, she had mental health problems, Nina Simone, I think it's fair to say. But the point I was trying to make is, even my baby just cares for me. The most romantic thing that she's done, the most popular romantic thing she's done, it is done with the voice, the sneering voice, if you like, of uh, Bob Dylan to a certain extent. So he is very aware, acutely aware of what his voice can do, and what it can't do. So even when he gets into a love song, it has to be slightly sneering, slightly dispassionate of that. And I think the times they are changing. I- I'll tell you one anecdote. Um, when I had my first success in life with a publishing company, I wasn't making a huge amount of money, but I bought a... Uh, uh, Jaguar XJ6, racing green, as you'd expect, for 1,500 quid. I think I got it down to 1,400 quid off some bloke in Milton Keynes that started a family, and his wife said, get rid of the Jag. Not, not this, not this anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Get rid of the Jag. I bought, I think, 1,400 quid of it. Drove it down the M1 back to London, and I used to shine it with my bare hands. I generally shined all the chrome on it with my bare hands every Sunday, and I was driving it, you know, like SJ6s, they had like a sunroof in those days. I was driving with the sunroof down or open, and I was driving around Elephant Castle in the centre of London and with Bob Dylan's The Times They Are A-Changing blasting out. And this would have been in the early 90s, the early 90s it would have been. And I got pulled over by the old bill. And, you know, with the sounds of Bob Dylan singing, uh, oh, wow. the times they are changing. And the old Bill said to me, so what are you? Are you a pop star or something like that? <laughs> <laughs> so I had all my dreadlocks flowing and all this sort of stuff. And I thought, yeah, that was an appropriate tune for the times they are changing. And it resonates with me because mm-hmm. it's, it's a folk tune in the real sense of a folk tune that it captures uh, the human condition. And, and, and I think that's one of the best things you have done. That and Blown in the Wind totally capture the human condition, and that's what a folk tune should do. Yeah, and, you're, not, you're not getting much change out of me and Tim, are you there? Well, no. <laughs> on, that note, on that note, I was going to bring this conversation to an end because uh, West Ham, you're up, your ultimate folk uh, team in terms of support. They've got that Cockney demographic right behind them. If you are a true Cockney, you support West Ham through and through. Even if they ain't won nothing for 56 years, is it now? That must oh, it, hurt. It, it's, it's very nearly for me, Dot, in a lifetime. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, well, obviously, we, we, we did have something of Renaissance in the 70s and uh, the start of the 80s. And who knows? The times they may be a changing at the London Stadium. You might even get into the top four this season. You never know your luck. <laughs> Thanks to a Scotsman. <laughs> Nothing to do with Cockneys, obviously. 